This conference will now be recorded. Okay, thanks so much everyone for, for waiting. We were having some technical difficulties. Um, but we are uh, going to flip right over to Catherine and not take up any more of your time. We're still going to make it uh, within the hour. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Catherine Moran. Um, today we're looking to do a little bit of a walkthrough on um, 3D bullets from the perspective of a radiation therapist. So I will um, just begin by sharing the screen. And... Perfect, and Catherine, there you go. Great, thank you everybody for your patience and uh, thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, so I'm gonna talk to you about uh, 3D printed bolus from my perspective as a radiation therapist. I'm not gonna delve too much into the nitty gritty of the physics and the technology. I'm really gonna take you through a series of case studies. So a couple of disclosures for you. The Nova Scotia Health Authority, where I work, uh, has previously received secondment fees on my behalf, and I have previously received travel costs for my work with uh, Adaptive. Another disclosure is I'm a radiation therapist for 15 years, and I've only ever worked at the Nova Scotia Health Authority. So I'm going to talk to you today about my perspective with traditional bolus. Um, the materials I talk about today are just from my experience. I totally understand that there are some very inventive things going on across the world and uh, other products available. Uh, these are just what I have had to um, use, what I've used over the course of my years. So the objectives today, I'm gonna walk you through five clinical cases. I'm gonna talk about post-mastectomy chest wall bolus, modulated electron bolus of the face, some pre-simulation design nose bolus, uh, pre-simulation design face bolus, uh, and then a case of uh, bolus over the face and eye that needed a cutout for a tungsten eye shield. For each of the cases, I'm going to try to touch on uh, traditional bolus options, some of the challenges and limitations that I've experienced over the years, uh, the workflow that we used for our 3D printed bolus structures, and any other considerations that come up during that time. So let's launch right into it. Uh, we're gonna talk about the first case and that's uh, the case of post-mastectomy chest wall bolus. I think many people can uh, relate to this. There's a lot, uh, it um, constitutes a large portion of our patient volumes and it's a challenge everybody experiences. So what are some of the traditional uh, bolus materials that we might use? Perhaps gel sheet bolus, maybe some thermoplastic bolus, brass mesh, or maybe even wet towels or wet gauze. So here's just a picture of some of the methods I use in my uh, center traditionally. And you see we have the gel sheet bolus in the bottom of the photo there. And uh, traditionally, we would use that cut to a standard size. We'd wrap it in some uh, plastic wrap to keep it covered for infectious control reasons uh, for every patient. Maybe we would break out some wet gauze to fill in some of the deep um, crevices or areas that might need a little extra bolusing. And then what do we do? We bring out the masking tape and we tape that bolus into place. And we try to get a really good fit across that patient's anatomy. And that all worked well and fine for many years. And then at least in our, we started doing comb beam CT imaging on our VMAP plans. And when those images started popping up, we were able to see exactly how that bolus was starting to, was fitting these patients. We started seeing air gaps that we had never appreciated before. And sometimes we were even seeing uh, areas of chest wall deformation when we used too much tape to secure that bolus. So then what our clinic started to do was they added this surge netting, this elastic netting around the patient's torso to try and keep that bolus flush to the skin. And we add these little um, dry ro uh, gauze rolls into crevices to help keep it conformed. And it all takes time. So we thought, hmm, is there a better way to do this? Can we use 3D printed bolus for these post-mastectomy chest wall patients? So what are the traditional challenges and limitations? I already alluded to some of this, but these patients have complex post-surgical anatomy. 
uh, maybe in the actual chest wall shape post-surgery, or even positioning limitations. Maybe they have decreased range of motion in their arms, and uh, it's hard to get that bolus up nice and snug. We also have bolus to skin conformity and daily reproducibility issues. The positioning of the bolus, uh, the air gap consistency, maybe wetness of wet gauze, or interstaff variability. I'm just going to pause for one second. We have some background noise online. Excellent. And then we have patient comfort issues, both physical or emotional comfort issues. So patients who do have uh, difficulty uh, post-surgery, maybe they have limited range of motion, maybe they're um, uncomfortable lying on that treatment couch. And the longer it takes me to position this bolus, the more uncomfortable they become. There's also um, this thought of emotional comfort. So I, I touched on interstaff variability of uh, placing that bolus. So I work in the center, there's 57 radiation therapists, and we can rotate back and forth onto treatment, treatment machines. And how I position that bolus um, the day I'm treating that patient has to be very similar to how the therapist the day before positioned it and the therapist the next day positioned it. Because patients remember that and they think about that and they're lying on the bed in a very vulnerable position. And if I'm starting to position that bolus maybe a little different than my partners have consistently been doing it, that goes through their minds and that can cause some emotional discomfort. And then finally, an infectious control issue. So are you using plastic wrap to cover your bolus? Um, are you, I once heard of a clinic or many clinics who use wet towels and they were actually hanging the wet towels up to dry all throughout the, the treatment room. Uh, what are the infectious control issues there? So we looked at our processes and we thought, can we do better? Can we use 3D printed bolus for these chest wall patients? Now I'm gonna give you the highlights of this study that we did. Um, more information is in the papers and the links are provided at the end of the presentation. But essentially we took 16 patients undergoing post-mastectomy chest wall radiotherapy. It was a conventional bolus on, bolus off fractionation. So for the bolus on days, we alternated between the 3D printed bolus and the standard gel sheet bolus that we use in our center. And we assessed the conformity of the bolus to the patient's surface using the daily comb beam CT images that we were taking anyway for patient alignment. Used dose symmetry OSLDs to match surface dose. And we also recorded the setup time for positioning the bolus. So the radiation therapist had a little stopwatch, and as soon as they were starting to place their bolus, they would turn it on. As soon as they were happy with their manipulation and they felt good to go, they turned the time off and recorded that. And the results of our study showed that the frequency of air gaps greater than or equal to five millimeters was reduced from 30% to 13%. Our in vivo dosimetry was within 3% between the 3D printed and the gel sheet bolus. And this had no statistical difference uh, with the treatment planning system. Now the bolus setup time was marginally reduced from 104 to 76 seconds. Now this isn't a huge reduction per patient, but you can imagine any time for that patient that they spend less on the treatment bed, uh, is better for them, especially when you're in a busy clinic and you have many of these patients. So here's just some images of um, two of our patients. And this first side here in um, light yellow are three fractions with the 3D printed bolus for one patient and three fractions with the gel sheet bolus for the same patient. And what you can see in the 3D printed bolus um, days is that that bolus is fairly consistent with its positioning day to day. The gel sheet bolus has some very minor differences in positioning, but overall was a fairly good fit for this patient. What you might see here is this um, light um, um, grayness on the screen. That's the position of one of those um, gauze rolls underneath the surgeon net elastic to uh, keep that bolus flush. 
And that's what has caused some of the difference from day-to-day -day variability on how that was positioned and where those subsequent gaps um, showed up. Now with this patient, patient B, again, with the 3D printed bolus, we see a very standard fit day-to-day. All right, doesn't matter who put that on or what uh, the circumstances were that day, that was the good fit. But on the gel sheet bolus days, we can see some very different um, fit issues. Um, and there, th this one has some, some rather large ripples and um, uh, fit issues. Now what this means is every day as a radiation therapist, I would have my comb beam CT image come up and I have to make an on the fly decision very quickly. What am I gonna do about that bolus? Is it clinically significant, those air gaps? Is there something I can adjust to make it fit better? Uh, where am I gonna do that? So am I gonna go in blindly into the room and feel around and try to find these air gaps and re-smooth it out? Uh, am I gonna take another comb beam CT at the expense of patient dose to make sure that that fit really well? That's gonna depend on the policies and procedures of your, of your center. Um, so really, any time we have to add these extra decision-making um, points within our, our um, treatment, it costs extra time. And uh, my decision has to be the same as the therapist before me and the therapist after me. I also alluded to this idea of chest wall deformity. So on this patient, you can see that the external body contour no longer fits um, from the uh, CT scan, which is this white contour here. We've actually deformed the body contour by about two uh, centimeters when we were using too much tape for that patient uh, to try and get the gel sheet bolus to fit properly. Again, that's a quick decision-making uh, point that I have to do when I'm looking at these comb beam CT images, and I have to say, okay, well, where am I gonna go and try to release that tape or move that bolus and am I gonna make a difference? And am I going to take another comb beam CT to ensure that I was actually effective? So those are all decisions that have to be made. Whereas on the very next uh, bolus fraction with the 3D printed bolus, it had a much smoother fit and it matched the natural contour of the body. You might notice these little um, gaps here in the bolus. Those are where we um, notched out areas for our OSLDs to sit. So from our study, um, we didn't go ahead and say that all patients receiving post-mastectomy chest wall therapy need 3D printed bolus. Instead, uh, we'd made a protocol that we're looking for patients that have this complex post-surgical surface anatomy, maybe areas of deficit or differential bolus that might be required. And we're leaving it up to the radiation oncologist to pre-identify these patients at consultation or we're giving autonomy to the radiation therapist to make that decision at the time of simulation. Another um, consideration is the size of your 3D printer bed. So some of these uh, post-mastectomy chest wall bolus can be quite large. So you do have to think about the size of your printer bed. However, that is a challenge we have overcome. We have also printed bilateral chest wall bolus by printing it in multiple different pieces that index and fit together. So our workflow for these post-mastectomy patients is that we identify that candidate. We proceed with their CT simulation with no bolus. The wires and BBs that we use at simulation are subtracted from the body contour. The bolus structure is created. It's 3D printed. And as a mini quality assurance step, we take just the printed bolus. And we do a quick CT scan of it and register it back on that patient's um, CT uh, simulation images. And it's just a quick um, check for us that there's no air gaps in our bolus, and then it's gonna be a reasonably good fit for that patient. The plan uh, carries on and the patient is treated. So that sums up our experience with chest wall bolus. I'm gonna move on to the next case study. So this is a case where we used modulated electron bolus for the face. We had a 67-year-old female who arrived to our clinic who had mycosis fungoides and two target areas. One was the anterior, one we called the anterior, which was the bilateral eyelids, nose and forehead. And the second target area was uh, on the lateral side and it was the right cheek. The intended treatment was 25 gray in 20 treatments. 
uh, with electron therapy. And the challenge here is complex superficial anatomy over critical structures, and we required bolus. So what are some of our traditional bolus options here? And many people might be smiling looking at those photos. Um, but we have gel sheet bolus, as we said before, you might want to cut some of that and try to squeeze it in underneath a cast and uh, make it fit really well to the patient. You might use thermoplastic boluses in the form of flat sheets or beads, or maybe you're going to break out the layered dental wax, which takes uh, quite a lot of time uh, and you successfully heat up um, small layers of wax and build them up over time. Or maybe you're gonna break out your 1980s crock pot, like we have, and you're gonna melt down dental wax and create a poured block over the entire face. And if you're, or in the target area. And if you're gonna do that, well then you're probably gonna have to do a plaster cast of the patient, create a positive, do all of your work on that plaster cast uh, before the patient comes back for treatment. So those are some of the options I've experienced in my center and sometimes uh, until recently, we still used. So what are the challenges and limitations here? Well, again, we have complex, highly varied surface contours to work with, both in the bolus design, so getting it to fit around those complex areas, and the electron distribution. So those high surface contours will, um, those high surface contours will cause differences in how that uh, electron distribution fits. And you've got a challenging PTV, and you want to get coverage to that. So your challenges are both in the bolus design and the electron distribution. We have the same challenges of bolus to skin conformity and the daily reproducibility of that. Your air gap consistency. If you're going to use wet gauze, uh, how wet is that wet gauze and is that reproducible? Then you have your patient comfort again. So you have your patient arrive to the clinic and you have to come up with what plan you're going to use with that patient in front of you. And then you start breaking out some warm thermoplastics or uh, casting the patient with plaster. Um, so that has physical and emotional uh, comfort issues to the patient. And then with these wax blocks and um, layered dental wax, uh, it takes time, it takes resources, and it takes skill. So the time may come from the patient being there, the radiation oncologist, the radiation therapist, do you have a room that you can go pour plaster in anymore? A lot of um, hospitals do not because space is at a premium. And is the skill there? So if this is not something that you break out very regularly, can your therapist very quickly come up with that um, plan and get that accomplished? I've poured a lot of wax in my time, but I'm sure it will take me a little longer nowadays to get that ready. Have you got these layers of dental wax that you've created? Have they started to splinter apart midway through treatment? It's happened to me. Has somebody dropped the bolus and it crumbled because it becomes so brittle? That's happened to me as well. And you've had to recreate that bolus uh, in time for the patient's next treatment. So we started using 3D printed bolus for these electron patients. And we're again looking for patients who have complex, highly variable surface anatomy. And I'm looking for patients that really have stable anatomy. So the anatomy is not going to change um, a whole lot between the time I start working on the case and the time the patient starts treatment. And we're looking for electron treatments here. So what we did is we identified our candidate and we brought her in and we did a mini CT, um, mini area of interest CT scan. We recorded the headrest we used. We uh, recorded the um, SSN and we made her head nice and straight. We just took a quick mini interest, um, mini area of interest scan. The RO then contoured the GTV. We had sent the patient on the way. The RO contoured the GTV, and we created this optimized bolus uh, structure. The bolus structure was 3D printed, and when it was ready, we brought the patient back to the simulator. The bolus was placed. Uh, we casted the patient, scanned them, and planning continued. And then the patient had treatment. So this is how some of, um, conceptually, how that optimized bolus uh, looks like. And you can learn more about this from our paper. The link is at the end of the presentation. But conceptually, this is one slice from um, the patient's mini area of interest scan. 
And we have added the one centimeter bolus that was needed to cover the distal edge of the PTV with the energy that was chosen. And then we actually uh, took it through the software program and we created a modulated electron bolus. So a differential thickness bolus throughout the treatment volume, which really uh, brought up this 90% uh, for conformity around the distal PTV and reduce the dose to the uh, deep critical structures. So that was our plan for this patient. And this is the actual 3D printed bolus in use. So we split this patient up into two treatment plans because the volume was very complex to target both areas in one treatment plan. So we have two separate uh, plants and this is the 3D printed bolus over the anterior of the face. And you can see some differential thickness bolus throughout that volume. Uh, this is uh, the bolus under the cast. And then on the right lateral cheek as well, we have a 3D printed bolus as well for that. Now this is um, really fine tuned um, thickness uh, modulation. I pride myself on being a very good radiation therapist, but if a physician came to me and said, please sculpt me some a wax block with this finesse uh, for a resulting dose distribution for an electron treatment, I don't think I could do that. Um, so this is quite, uh, quite unique and worked very well for this patient. And this is how that bolus looked um, when we finally put it on the patient and we did the planning CTC, CT sim. Uh, this is just two different slices and we were, achieve, we were able to achieve the dose coverage that we had anticipated. And again, for the right lateral cheek as well, this is the fit of the bolus as well. And you can see some slight modulation required to scoop up the uh, dose coverage there to match the PTV. So moving on to our third case. So this is pre-simulation designed nose bolus. And this one quite excited us. So we had a 68 year old gentleman who was coming into the center. He was post-surgery times two. He had an SCC of the left side of the nasal septum with resection and reconstruction. He then had recurrence, including the septum and the columella with subsequent resection and reconstruction followed by radiation therapy. The intended treatment was 60 gray in 30 fractions with a VMAT technique. And again, the complications here or the challenges is we have a very complex anatomy we have thin nasal structures that required bolus, and this is all adjacent to air cavities. So what are we going to break out and use uh, traditionally for this gentleman? So maybe what we're going to do is use wet gauze up both nostrils. Maybe I'm going to um, soften up wax and create wax nose plugs or thermoplastic beads then I might have to do something completely different to cover the tip of the nose and the columella. So we have this complex, highly varied surface contour and our bolus design, are we gonna make multiple pieces? Uh, can we make one piece? Are we gonna try to stick pieces together? Is it gonna last? We have our same conformity and daily reproducibility issues, especially if we're gonna use wet gauze in the nostrils. How wet is that? How comfortable is that for the patient? If I have a patient who arrives to me at CT Sim and this is their first experience in the cancer center and now I have to break out some maybe wax nose plugs or wet gauze or warm uh, thermoplastic beads, um, that's a challenge to patients. The bolus robustness again. So is my bolus allows uh, that very long treatment uh, course? So this was an interesting workflow that we used. And uh, in this case, again, we have a complex, highly variable surface anatomy to work with. But this patient had recent diagnostic CT images and he had stable anatomy. So he was post-surgery and the uh, positioning of the nasal structures in the CT, um, diagnostic CT images uh, would be very reflective of how he would be for um, simulation. So the fact that he might be CT scanned in a different position, those nasal structures are not gonna change very much when you rotate or move or add a different headrest. So we actually pre-identified this candidate when the radiation oncologist came to me and said, I have this challenging case. And we brought in their uh, recent diagnostic images 
And from there, the RO contoured their GTV, and we created this optimized, very complex bolus structure. We 3D printed it, and then the patient arrived for their one and only CT scan, and we had this prefabricated bolus that would fit through both nostrils and around the tip of the nose. And that was put in for CT sim. We casted the patient, they planned, and the patient went on for treatment. So here are some of the images uh, of the bolus design. So you'll see here these little tips here um, were where it goes up both nostrils. This was printed in a uh, flexible printing material. So the tips of this bolus were flexible. However, when the thickness increases, the flexibility decreases. Now, what we saw from this uh, on initial iteration of this design, it was one solid piece. And the way the tips of those, um, of the bolus that goes up the nostril flare laterally, it was gonna be impossible to actually manipulate that into the patient's nose. So what we did is we cleaved the design and we added a little um, pin and hole uh, clip that we could clip both pieces together. So this is the patient at time of simulation. The cleave is down the center. So it was two halves of the bolus. We also had a mouth bite, which um, added extra challenges. And we just used a little bit of tape to secure the bolus up because the weight of it was gonna tip it forward a little bit and then it wouldn't have the snug fit while then I cast it over top of that. And this is how that bolus fit both on the planning CT and on one of the subsequent days of treatment on the cone beam CT. And you can see very uh, light change in density there. And that is where the bolus is into both nostrils and then the bolus fits around the tip. And you get that same uh, picture on treatment. And what was really amazing about this uh, case, not only could we have a patient arrive to the clinic for the very first time and have their bolus ready for them, was that the patient found it so much more comfortable, they were actually able to put it in themselves every day for treatment after just a couple treatments. So moving on to the fourth case. So this is another case of pre-simulation designed face bolus. So in this case, we had a 61-year-old female, diffuse B-cell lymphoma. The intended treatment was 25 gray and 10 fractions VMAT. And she had complex anatomy with high curvatures, two target volumes, the left nasal and medial canthus and the right zygomatic region. She also had recent diagnostic CT images available and her anatomy was fairly, uh, the lesions were fairly flat. They weren't growing at uh, any type of um, considerable rate. So she made for a great candidate to follow the same workflow that our last patient did. So we actually brought her diagnostic CT images the RO contoured the GTV, and in this case, we created a uniform thickness bolus. The bolus was printed, and the patient arrived for CT sim. The bolus was already ready. We put it on, we casted her, scanned her, planned her, and she came back for treatment. Now, the one thing we learned about this one is that when the radiation oncologist originally contoured the uh, two separate areas, the planners created two separate bolus structures. And that looked great until we started examining this, the, the rendering of that. And what you'll notice is um, the area over the um, medial canthus would be really easy for me to take that bolus structure and put it right back on the patient when they come for CSIM. And that's because we have um, curvature here, we have the nose, we have the medial canthi, we have the supraorbital ridge, the forehead. That's all really good anatomy for me to lock that into place without much struggle. However, this piece on the side lacked a whole lot of curvatures and anatomy for me to really confidently replace that bolus exactly how it was attended in the um, original planning. So what we did is we did a design change and we actually put it into one larger piece of bolus that went across the face and down the side of the face as well. And that allowed us to use the structures to really um, increase uh, a confident fit for this patient. 
And this is the result on the CT SIM images, and we get a really great fit throughout for that um, bolus piece. So that was a learning piece, is um, to create these boluses that we want to um, pre-print, create them with enough anatomy and enough curvature that the therapist can accurately and confidently place that bolus at the time of the CT SIM. The other limitation with having had just this side bolus here was that if this piece was lingering on its own, when I went to put the cast over the patient, likely the cast might pull it down and make it slip a little. Whereas this bolus is nice and sturdy on the patient's face, when I'm casting over that, it's not slipping and moving. So her case continued. So one year later, she's now 62 years old, and she comes back to us with three lesions in close proximity on her back. And these are the planning images here, her original CT. So she had three lesions. There was one a little bit lower down, but close to there. And what the therapist did is they placed our traditional gel bolus uh, clinically at time of CT SIM. So our radiation oncologist came in, they walked, he wired the three lesions um, dictated where he wanted the bolus to be placed, and they placed it with the boundaries that the radiation oncologist had chosen, and she went off for planning. However, what we found was a new workflow, and that's when a uh, clinically placed bolus might be non-optimal. So maybe your bolus thickness that you chose at time of sim should be greater, thicker, um, thinner, Maybe it needs to be larger to encompass the uh, final treatment volume. And that's what we found with this patient. So she had been simulated with traditional bolus. Planning was initiated, and they found that the bolus uh, didn't have optimal coverage. So if I take you back one slide, you'll see that laterally here, that bolus is really close to the PTV. And the planners felt that um, a better job could be done uh, to maximize that extent. And while we were at it, maybe get rid of some of these um, air gaps that we were not able to um, get rid of during CT simulation with standard bolus. So what we did is we uh, 3D, we re-optimized that bolus, 3D printed it and brought the patient back. And we were able to extend it laterally, but we were also able to achieve a better conformity as, um, as a second wind for this patient and the patient went on for treatment. And my fifth case and final one for you today is a case of um, bolus that needed to go over the face and the eye, but the patient also needed this tungsten eye shield uh, and we needed to create this bolus with a cutout for that. So this was a 46 year old woman. She had Merkel cell lesion of her right eyelid and right parotid uh, neck. She was gonna have two treatment plans, the neck uh, VMAP plan and the eyelid electron treatment. Again, this patient has complex curvatures and the unique feature here was the radiation oncologist really wanted to utilize a tungsten eye shield. Now, maybe we could have used modulated electron bolus and maybe we wouldn't have needed that tungsten eye shield, but I have to say this case came through over the summer and many of our experts in the 3D printing and the modulation of the bolus happened to be on vacation. And this is what the radiation oncologist was really set on. So what would we do for this patient? Well, again, maybe we would pull up some of our older bolusing materials, but we have this added complexity of this tungsten eye shield. Now, if I were to use a thermoplastic over that, is my thermoplastic gonna stick to that eye shield? Is that gonna cause me problems when after I finish my simulation and I take, try to take that off? How is that gonna feel comfort-wise uh, for the patient to have this uh, tungsten eye shield in place and then me manipulating and molding uh, wax or thermoplastics or anything around that? If I use wet gauze, again, what's the consistency there? Again, bolus robustness is another problem. So in this case, uh, what we found interesting uh, was, again, this highly variable surface anatomy. She had stable anatomy, so the shape of her eyelid was not going to change much from the time we started to the time we carried on with planning. Uh, she had this additional comfort issue with the eye shield. 
And what we did here was we could actually have a number of print options available to us. So we identified this candidate. We brought her in with the, and did the mini area of interest CT scan. Again, choosing a headdress and recording it, choosing an SSN, recording it, making her nice and straight. The arrow contoured the GTV. And we created this uniform thickness bolus with a central eye shield opening. And what we actually did was we varied the size and the shape of that central opening, and uh, we varied the position of it. And we printed four different options. The patient was brought back for CT SIM, the eye shield was placed, and then we had four bolus options to look at very quickly and see which one would fit that tungsten eye shield perfectly without causing the patient any more discomfort. Then we cast it, we scanned, and uh, continued the planning and the patient is being treated. And this is sort of how it looks. So outside here is the 3D printed bolus. This is the opening for that tungsten eye shield, which they filled with a small piece of gel bolus, which would be a little bit softer just over that eye shield. Here's the CT, uh, the, the uh, actual comb beam image from one of our treatments. That's the eye shield there. This is the 3D printed bolus that's getting good contact. Little space here where the gel bolus fits perfectly in there and is a little bit softer over that eye. And then a nice good fit through the side of the face. So we found that to be a very interesting case. Now the other thing with doing um, the 3D printed bolus from a mini area of interest scan is you could evaluate multiple options before the patient even arrives back for SIM, and then you're not bounded by one option. So very easily, um, if, the, if it wasn't summer vacation and we had this, the um, skill set available at our disposal, we would have maybe uh, tried some modulated bolus options and seen what the dose distribution would look like for that and then make the best option for the patient. However, this option worked very well for this patient and she's um, very comfortable on treatment with her bolus. So finally, I'll leave you with um, a few images of some of our other very unique cases. This is a patient that needed bolus over a very nodular uh, lesion on the back of the hand there. And again, we used the mini area of interest scan. So we brought the patient in, we had her uh, hand um, fit into an Accuform cushion uh, for reproducibility. We did the uh, scan and we created this 3D printed bolus that actually fit over the nodules and down into in between the digits very well. We brought the patient back once the bolus was ready. We slipped the bolus on and we cast it right over on top of that and scanned and continued planning. This patient here had a very large scalp lesion on the back of his, or on the superior aspect of his scalp, and he was in considerable pain. So anytime we would touch this patient to try to put or manipulate or make bolus for him, he was in significant pain. The other issue, and you, I'm not sure if you can really see it from my images, there's a tiny um, area increased deficit. So there was about two or three millimeters uh, of this extra deficit in a circular um, configuration on that patient's scalp. So if I had to use traditional bolus materials, I might have wanted to fill that area with uh, wet gauze first and then put um, another form of bolus on top. But the 3D printed bolus actually captured very slightly that um, deficit and was able to uh, fill that in that one piece of bolus. This patient here, again, had um, similar to our pre-printed bolus that I presented to you. We used her diagnostic images and we pre-printed bolus that fit perfectly over the eyes, the uh, forehead and the nose. And that was available for her for her one and only CT SIM that was required. And finally, this gentleman came to us with um, significant nodular uh, lesions on his neck. Now, when he arrived to us in the CT SIM, he was in a great amount of pain and distress. We were not gonna be able to use traditional bolus on him and cast him at that appointment because he was in so much uh, pain and distress. So we decided to use our 3D bolusing technique on him. And we just captured a mini area of interest scan with our recorded headrest and we let him go. We let him go with appropriate pain medication to, and steroids to um, get into a better state. 
And then he came back to Sim, and when he came back, we had this perfectly created 3D bolus to fit over these lesions. And he was much more comfortable at that point. We could place the bolus, cast him, and scan him, and it made for a better experience for that patient. So just to recap slightly, uh, we do basically two workflows in my center. We have pre-simulation bolus that's created directly from existing or recent diagnostic imaging. And for that, you're really going to look for cases where the uh, anatomy is not going to change because of the positioning. So the face and the scalp, those work really well for us uh, in this workflow. And then we have post-simulation design bolus that's created directly from our CT simulation images. Whether that's challenging post-mastectomy chest wall bolus, whether it's unique and challenging cases, and these may require two CT sims to complete, or modulated electron bolus, or when you found that the clinically placed, placed bolus is not optimal and you need adjusting, that's another workflow that we discovered. These are the three papers that I allude to in our discussion today. So you can uh, find more information about the technical and physics aspects of the 3D printed bolus in those. And I will thank you for listening today and uh, open the floor up to any questions. You can use the online chat or you can just go ahead and speak. So uh, one question is, uh, what are our typical print times? And uh, second question right after that was, how long does it take to print a bolus? So that really is going to depend on the size, the shape, and the thickness of the bolus structure that you're creating. Um, so they can take anywhere from a couple hours to a longer time, um, maybe six or seven hours. Now, the unique thing about 3D printing bolus is that um, you're taking the heavy lifting off of the radiation therapist at the time of the simulation with the patient and the radiation oncologist and the simulator time, and you're offsetting that to a machine to print the, that bolus. So oftentimes what we do is we set those bolus up, structures up to print, and we walk away and we carry on with the rest of our day. We can even set them up to print overnight. So we really don't find that to be much of a limiting factor. And I just see a question uh, that asking if it would be possible to have a copy of the presentation. Um, so absolutely, we'll be sending everyone that attended a copy and it will be posted uh, on our social channels as well as through our weekly email. Um, if you're not already on our email list, um, just send a message to info at adaptive.com and you can be added. And are there any additional questions for Catherine? For the patient with the neck mass, did you have to re-sim and make new bolus? No. So the patient arrived for their simulation. Uh, we realized we were not able to um, make bolus on him at that time. So we did a mini scan and then we sent him on his way. The bolus was created, um, three, was 3D printed. The patient was brought back in and we slipped that bolus on. We casted, uh, scanned, he had his treatment. Now that was a palliative treatment. So we didn't have um, a large treatment course. So that mass wasn't changing shape drastically during treatment. Um, so that made it um, a good case to use. Yes, so no resim needed during the course of that treatment because it was a palliative short course treatment and there were no um, significant changes during the course of treatment. Uh, one question was, I talked about finding the right position for surfaces without landmarks and do we have uh, this problem with our chest walls? 
So our chest wall bolus um, covers um, the entire extent of the post mastectomy site. And um, we have been found, finding that there are enough unique dips and curves and anatomy to fit that bolus visually. However, what the treatment planner has been doing for us that really helps is they take a measurement from the posterior uh, lateral aspect of the bolus to the treatment bed. We use that as a good verification. And um, they give us a measurement superiorly uh, from our user origin or our tattoo to really uh, help us position that bolus when it comes time for treatment. Okay, and just looking, making sure there's no additional questions. Did you see that one there? So I have not myself, there's a question about optical surface scanning, and I myself have not um, uh, worked with the optical scanner uh, myself. Um, we do have one on order for our department, so it's something I would really like to um, investigate at some point. And then there's a question about what are steps for ordering a 3D print. So in my department, this is all, uh, we do this locally. It's something we do right in our clinic with the software that we have and our own 3D printer. Um, so there's no steps for us ordering any particular 3D prints. Uh, printing cost is always gonna depend on how much filament you use, uh, the thickness of your bolus structure, um, the uh, type of filament you use, um, but it's very cost of the, the printing material is very cost effective, especially when comparing against um, some of the other um, uh, materials that are out there, such as gel sheet bolus. Uh, we have not had to postpone any starts of treatment. Uh, because we do give ourselves good leeway on getting that um, 3D print uh, done. We have worked with multiple different um, 3D printing, uh, 3D printers, and uh, we have experienced printers that have uh, failed uh, due to maybe a power bump um, or something like that going on in our, um, in our hospital. And uh, we have restarted that print the next day if required. So that is a factor and we do um, keep, keep that into consideration um, so that there are no treatment delays. What 3D printer do we use? So um, we have a couple uh, available to us, uh, but we tend to use our um, Airwolf Axiom 3D printer um, fairly regularly. Okay, and uh, any additional questions for Catherine? Which filament do we use? So we um, do print with uh, PLA. We can we have printed with some Ninja Flex uh, material. Uh, we choose the materials that are available to us um, locally and um, what is best for that patient's case. And I'm going to uh, end it there today in the um, interest of time. And I thank you very much for all the questions and for sitting with me today. Thank you all. And uh, as mentioned earlier, there will be a recording for all those that attended. Have a great day.